Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers Podcast. Thank you for joining us for a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. All right, we'll go ahead and start in three, two, one. Welcome, I'm Lori Lee Binstock, and this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. Thank you for joining us for a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast on Mental Health News Radio Network. This podcast is also available wherever you get your podcasts, but I do suggest checking out Mental Health News Radio Network to find all your podcasts related to mental health. Today's guest is Arlene. Is it? Alreen, 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 Alreen. I'll start that. In three, two, yeah. one. Today's guest. <clears throat> three, two, one. Today's guest is Alreen Hagwist. Motivated by the pains of her childhood, Alreen became a lawyer in order to stand up for victims of abuse. She founded her own firm, Hagwist and Eck LLP, in San Diego in 2008, which has helped hundreds of other women stand up for themselves. Alreen has challenged high-profile entities, including the Salk Institute, Trader Joe's, Kaiser Permanente, the San Diego Sheriff's Department, and a president-elect. Alreen's core message is that as a society, we need to break the silence and help women stand up to their abusers. In 2023, she broke her own silence and published her story in the book, Fired Up, Fueling Triumph from Trauma. Alreen, thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, I know. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Wow. So I first of all, I always ask, you know, this is a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast, where, you know, you are a trauma survivor and you are thriving in helping others. Can you tell me how you got from there to here? Sure. So background wise, um, I was abused as a child by my father in all the various ways, um, physically, emotionally, verbally, and sexually. And, you know, I wanted at that time for somebody to save me. And despite my mom knowing what was going on, she stayed silent. Um, mm. And so I think his abuse and her silence really shaped me because now I just, I can't be silent in the face of injustice um, and somebody being taken advantage of. So um, I've used that, that triggering ability um, as my superpower to stand up for my clients. Wow. When were you able, when did you realize like, I need to do something? Cause I mean, you, it, it's really hard. You know, I was also, I was sexually abused by my father. Sorry. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's a long road to get from, you know, trauma survivor to thriving. It took me took thing years. <sighs> uh, how, how was that for you? Or did you know immediately that something needs to be done? No, for sure. That was not the case. <laughs> um, you know, you don't wake up and say, oh, wow, look at all the abuse I suffered. You know, that's the thing causing all my problems. And now it's time to fix it. Um, I hid behind my trauma. I never talked about it um, or talked about the abuse. And I didn't know that I had been traumatized from mm. the abuse um, until much later. Um, you know, I didn't even call it abuse. It was just the household I grew up in. It was the life that I had. And um, didn't think um, anything of it. It wasn't, I would say really um, later on in my life, um, when I had left my house, I got out, I got, went to college. Um, and at that point, I felt so free, like the first time that I got to be me and felt the escape. Um, 
And so I thought, you know, I've left it behind. What's the problem, right? Like if you've left your abuse, you've moved on. Right. You know, that was me too. <laughs> <laughs> what's the problem? It's all good. Um, but it just started really showing up in relationships and primarily with the relationship with my husband, um, where, you know, he's the most patient, gentle man and his, like, if I thought he was, you know, being manipulative or lying or, um, just, you know, had the wrong tone, it would just trigger me and it caused issues in our relationship. And then we had a daughter, um, and, you know, I was, <sighs> you're supposed to feel this like ecstatic thing when you have a baby. And I was really scared of hurting her um, and abusing her unknowingly or something. And so um, I really started on this healing journey to create a better relationship with my husband um, and to create a better relationship with my daughter. But same thing. I didn't know the way I was feeling was caused by my abuse and, and the trauma I experienced as a result. And it wasn't until I went to therapy and really started talking about it and kind of processing what was going on and things were, you know, given names and, and, and labels. And I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't just like, once you leave your abuse, it's like, you know, everything is not just all great. You know, like there's still, you have to unpackage a lot because of the consequences it left behind. Wow, I feel like you're telling this, you're you're speaking, and I'm like, yeah, it sounds exactly like my like I feel because I felt that like I didn't know like I didn't call it abuse. I didn't know I, this is my house. This is yeah. what we, this is what my family is like. Um, that's so interesting because I think there are probably so many people out there who are thinking the exact same. Is this abuse? I'd like to think that we're talking about this kind of stuff a lot more, where people are like, no, this is abuse, right? But unfortunately, we're not. I mean, abuse, there's so much shame associated with abuse that we don't talk about it. We're so terrified of talking about it. But I think that's the only way to move forward and change the statistics and to have it stop happening is for us to be able to have this conversation. I mean, the fact that you've created an entire podcast, you know, to talk about trauma and to talk about people surviving from it and then thriving from it, I think is so important. Because when you're going through it, you really feel like you're all alone. You don't realize how prevalent it is or that other people are experiencing it. Um, but once you start realizing that, that's what I think um, helps you, you know, let it out and not let it eat you up inside. Wow, exactly. Very well said. Um, well, you know, that being said, how did you become a lawyer? Did you know that that was where you wanted to go because you wanted to help other people? It wasn't, um, so I've wanted to be a lawyer since I was a kid. Um, and, you know, growing up in my dysfunctional household, um, there wasn't um, a lot of role models. You know, I was the first to go to college, first to go to law school. So it wasn't like I was following in somebody's footsteps. Um, but there was a spiritual leader who was a lawyer. And I was like, well, that seems like a good person to follow. And so that's where the idea came from of being mm. a lawyer. Um, and I, I just always said it, I played the game of life with my, with my cousin and I was, you know, always going to be the lawyer in the game of life. And I just, um, pursued that. And school was really a place where, um, you know, growing up, you know, I really wanted to be a good kid. I, I thought if I was a good kid and I, you know, didn't speak up and I behaved and I went to church and I did all the things that my parents wanted, um, I could fix everything, you know, I could create this happy, happy life um, for everybody in the house. Um, that wasn't the case, but school was like an out, right? I did well mm -hmm. at it. Um, and it, I think, allowed my confidence to build. And it also made me realize, and this wasn't until high school, but I realized like, oh, I could go to college and get out of the house. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> and so that was like a light bulb uh, moment. Like, and so I, you know, worked even harder, figured out how to apply for college um, and went to college, you know, again, still on this track of wanting to go to um, uh, law school. When I got to college, I think that's really where I realized that I'm doing it to help people, right? Like where it's like, oh, what does a lawyer do? Mm -hmm. oh, it, it helps people, you know? It wasn't just something different than my household. It was a way to help people. Um, and so that I think developed when I got out of my house. Um, and then 
you know, I, I became a lawyer. I've always just helped people. I've never helped business or companies. I've always been a person trying to help, you know, people who have been victimized or abused or taken advantage of by somebody in power um, and in influence. And again, like this was just like a natural thing. I didn't think about, you know, this is why I'm doing it um, until later when I realized wow, this like passion, this is what makes me a good lawyer and why people want me. It's like, oh, like, okay. So if I can use my trigger, which is me getting really fired up when somebody's getting taken advantage of, and if I can hone that in, that's going to make me really powerful. So that is what developed. Um, as I got into my adult life, I used something that, you know, was looked on negatively, right. The anger that was really built up, um, mm -hmm. for people taking advantage of, but learning how to like control that anger and put it into my arguments and using the law to stand up for my clients is what makes me really effective. Um, wow. Cause, <laughs> Cause it's like, I'm standing up for you with that same rage, but I have like using the law and the rights that you have, you know, to our advantage. Did you have to figure out how to channel that rage? Yes. Like how? Like I'm still working <laughs> on that. <laughs> been a Teach lot of work. I know, right? <laughs> Um, just realizing that it's a lot more effective because right. If I start raging at you, I'm like the crazy one. Right. right. But if <laughs> I'm typically the crazy one, <laughs> I'm typically the crazy one. So learning, recognizing that, um, and it, you know, was a process. So when I would start raging, you know, learning how to take deep breaths, to step away from this situation, to feel the, the anger in your body, like, um, I get really, really hot. Like my body's yeah. literally on fire. And so recognizing what's going on, taking the deep breath and then remembering like, okay, what am I here to do? I know this is, I'm being triggered by my own past, but that's not what we're working on today, right? That's not what we're going for today. This is for my client and I'm going to be a lot more effective for this woman if I hone in on the anger and present it for what happened to her. So it was a process. I would say I stepping away, feeling it taking deep breaths um, was the steps that I took to now be able to channel that anger into a positive way. Wow. That, that's impressive. That's very <laughs> impressive. Cause I know what that feels like to just, yeah. okay, I can't let that rage like take over. Cause mm -hmm. like you said, you'll look like the crazy person yeah. <laughs> um, who can't control their anger. Um, do you, so when you're helping, when you're, when you're, working with clients or looking for clients or mm -hmm. do clients come to you and do they know that this is this is your specialty in dealing with um violence against women yeah i mean i think from if they're finding us you know on our website or our social channels i think they know that if they're getting a referral you know they they know that um so i think they know when they come in um that this is what our specialty is but i don't think until they meet me um, do they realize like what kind of advocate I am, right? Because then they see me talk, they see me how I am when I go up against the other side. And I think that's when a client really is like, oh, okay, I made a good decision. You know what I mean? Like right. they might know it. I might advertise for it on my website. You hear about it, but you don't really know. You don't feel, and they don't feel don't... it until you're in front of, yes. Exactly, exactly. Wow. Um, that, and then they're like, they're in and they they get like why they want me as opposed to somebody else. Do, uh, do you get men who come to you who have also been victimized? Yeah, not a lot. Um, so the men that come to us primarily, um, they have experienced discrimination in the form of their race or their disability. Um, it's very, I mean, not that we don't have them, but being um, sexually harassed as a man, I would say is a lot less common. Mm -hmm. And they are also, seems like it's harder for them to to stand up, right? Because as a man, they should take it or, oh, as a man, they should have liked it um, when they're right. harassed, you know? And so I don't think we, we get that many people for that reason, um, but we do represent men, um, but it's usually for disability discrimination or retaliation cases. How do you talk to, because I'm assuming a lot of these people are very afraid to stand up to their abusers. I mean, do you ever have issues with them wanting to back out? You know, I, I mean, I, I can imagine it could be extremely difficult to to face the person who, who victimized them. For sure. And I would say that's every single client that comes <sighs> in. Yeah. 
Yeah. They are all very scared to stand up for themselves because of the consequences um, that they're they're worried about either in their family or at their job or how people are going to view them. You know, it's that same shame that we've experienced from going through abuse. They also have that. So I would say every person that comes into our office is afraid. I think what's really powerful is, um, you know, when they're standing up for themselves, they get us. They have a whole team because I get you need your people. You can't mm -hmm. go in it alone and you shouldn't have to go into it alone. But what I remind them is that, you know, all of these laws are written to protect you, to help you. As a society, we condemn these acts. You know, as a society, we have all said this is not acceptable conduct. But unfortunately, it happens. And the only way to make a difference is you have to stand up for yourself. You find your people to help you. And we have at our office um, a survivor advocate. She's not a lawyer. She's not a therapist, but she's gone through the legal system. She has a ton of training, um, trauma-informed training on mm. how to communicate, you know, with people that have been abused and traumatized. Um, and so she's also there to help you, you know, go through the process and explain how things are going to work um, so you don't feel like you're alone um, and kind of can work through the fear. And then we always recommend our clients have like a therapist or some support, you know, outside of our law office. So you're kind of, you, you build a team, you, you build a team when you, when you stand up for yourself and, and we're part of, part of that team. Wow. Were you going back to your personal story? Were you able to stand up to your abuser, to your no. father? No. no, yeah, no, I never said anything. So um, my abuse, my sexual abuse, my the other forms of abuse never stopped, but the sexual abuse stopped um, when I was about 12 um and that was because the sister who's seven years older than me finally said something and mm -hmm. because she said something you know there was that conversation in the family and that's when I realized for the first time that I wasn't alone you know right. I thought I was and I suspected I wasn't because I had seen um you know the way my dad was but I closed my eyes and so but that was the first time we talked about it that he had this, I was the youngest of six girls. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So it was, and the youngest of 10 kids. Um, and so the, the realization that like, wow, this has been going on and it finally stopped because my sister said something um, was really powerful. It's another one of those things. I didn't think about it then, but you know, I know it now, like, you know, when you say something, you not only help yourself, but you help, you know, Others. the next group. Yeah. The next group. So um so anyway, so we did uh, talk about it. You know, there was that conversation is, you know, if we report my father, he could go to jail and what would those consequences be? And so um, even though my sister said something, I personally never did to him. Um, and and the discussion amongst uh, the sisters were, was, you know, we were just not going to say anything um, and continue to essentially pretend like it never happened, right? Yeah. Um, and buried it there. Um, and never talked about it after that, you know? Um, and so I would say the first time I'm standing up for myself is by writing the book, right? Yeah. That, is, that, that has been my step. I didn't do litigation. I didn't confront my father about what he did. Um, I wrote a book and I let out, you know, all the things we were, we've been keeping inside. Yeah. I wanted to ask, how was that writing your story? Um, it's been, it was interesting, I would say, um, you know, again, you think you have moved past everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you're like, I'm so healed. It's all, you know, it's all <laughs> I can totally do this. Um, but I would say each step was a process writing it, you know, and each time I read it and edited it and read it again, it took that power, it took more power away from it where it didn't affect me the same way. I mean, the fact that I'm on a podcast talking to you about it, is huge, but that's like another step, right? Writing yeah. it was a step, editing it was a step, publishing it was a step, sharing it, <laughs> you know, yeah. then you published it, but then you actually, people can now get a copy wherever they're at, you know, was a step. Um, right. And each step I would say that was emotional and the parts of you that are scared always come back, you know, even coming on podcasts and talking about it, that fear of like, what are people going to think? How am I going to be, um, looked at now that people know this. I mean, that each step yeah. of the process brought that fear and each step 
um, I believe has made me stronger for, for working through it, right? Like, it's just not allowing something to hold power over you um, and allows me to just be okay in my own skin um, and be confident in it. Wow. Um, do you have a relationship with your parents or even your siblings? Yeah. So my father, I mean, that's what's, you know, I think complicated is I have a lot of good memories with him too. You know, most of it is him being a monster, but then, you know, I traveled together and, you know, he, you know, supported me, you know, all through college and um, we ate, you know, food together and tra traveled. And um, so he passed 11 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was the one I spoke to more because he spoke English. My mom barely speaks English. Um, and my mom, I always had a lot of empathy for, and both of my parents, I have a lot of empathy for in the sense, like, I'm sure, you know, their upbringing was hard and they had their own trauma and, you know, they have probably had abuse. I, I don't know what it is, but I am assuming based on, um, where they grew up and how they grew up. Mm -hmm. Um, but my mom, I always had a lot of empathy for her because, to me, she was like in the group of people being abused. She was one of the, you know, just like me, you know, that my dad was physically and verbally and emotionally abusive too, you know? And so it wasn't until I had my daughter that I was really mad at my mom. And, you know, mm, people always say yeah. that the mom always gets it. And, you know, I was really mad at my mom because I think it's so natural. Like it's just in you to want to protect your child. And I don't feel like she ever protected us because she, like I said, never said anything. And I think she could have, you know, again, wow, yeah. in an arranged marriage at 17. So again, she was a child herself. So I have that empathy, but at the same time, it's like, you know, by the time she had me, she was 40 years old. And so it's like, okay, at this age, you know, how did you at that point not say anything? Yeah. Um, so anyways, I say that with, do I still have a relationship with my mom? Yes. I talk to her constantly. Um, I have, you know, again, the empathy for her. We can't really communicate. And it's not like I can tell her like, oh, I'm so mad at you. You know, how do you not say anything? Cause she just doesn't get it. Like it's right. like what I, you know, for her, she did the best she could for her. We had a good life. What's the problem? Like he didn't throw us out. Um, and he wasn't that bad because he, you know, supported us. So what are you complaining about? Like, stop being such an ungrateful brat, you know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, no, right. So That's... I have the relationship and I just ha try to have compassion and empathy to, you know, that her life and her understanding and, um, and I don't need to try to convince her of otherwise. Wow. That's, that's a key, the empathy and compassion yeah. that, comp that, that is everything. Um, you know, I, didn't confront I told my mom about the my abuse at the age of 35 and you know she was she was shocked she confronted my father my father apologized I, he, I never talked to him after that um and I had my own healing that I needed to do but it was like a, probably a year after that when my mom was like well you know can you just forgive forgive and forget <laughs> And I remember being like, no. And she's like, we want to see our grandchildren. I'm like, my grand, your, my, your kids are, my kids are never coming near him. Like that was like, that was, I think what triggered me to like go down the spiral mm -hmm. when my, I brought my children to my parents' house. Um, and I felt very unsettled. My husband was like, what is going on with you? You, you just, you seem more upset than you usually are when we're here <laughs> and I was like you know because he was like let's go out with our friends your parents can watch the kids and I'm like I don't think this is a good idea yeah. um and so I just remember after my mom said that I was so upset and then I went through this I went through therapy I went through it was actually psychedelic integrative therapy um with 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 um through my therapist and I remember I was feeling this, like this loss. I was feeling as if I lost my child and I was freaking out. And so, you know, they, they, they asked me like, what's, what's going on? You seem, you seem, you seem like you're wincing. What's happening? And it's like, I, I feel like I'm losing my daughter. And they're like, well, what does that feel like? What is that making you think of? And then it immediately I thought, oh my gosh, this is what my mom must have felt like when I said that I'm cutting you guys off, 
where she were, but she just didn't know any better. She didn't, she, her, for her, her coping mechanism was, I need to, you need to forgive and forget so I can forgive and forget that this all happened. We can go back to being normal and Mm -hmm. that, you know, and I, I, and at that moment, I kind of understood because the feeling that I was getting of losing my own daughter was really difficult for me to handle. But when I understood that that's probably what my mother was going through, I could see why she would develop this mechanism to not feel that way because it was pretty horrible. Yeah. Um, so I, 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 that, that, that empathy and compassion piece is so important because I, I, you know, in he, my own healing with my father, I learned that he was also abused um, by his father. So it was one of those things where it's like, okay. I have empathy and compassion for you and your younger self and what had happened to you. But I, I, for my own peace of mind, I can't be around it. Yeah. I'm breaking the generational trauma. I am not going to be passing it on to my kids, you know, and that requires me to do the work. So it is not passed on. um, Exactly. And then, and you know, I feel like there's, there's not enough credit out there. It's really hard work to break it like generational cycles, you know, uh, I, it's just, it's, it's really hard work. And I do think it's worth doing because, you know, this is, you don't want to get it to have it passed on, you know, because my dad abused me, you know, that, that anger, like I realized that I had a lot of anger because my daughter was like four around four at the time where I start that when I was started freaking out, um, about like the, like my dad being around and gosh, it was just, it was just so difficult. And I was so angry and that's how I would lash out. I would get mad at my children. And, you know, that's when I went into treatment. I went to treatment for like for 31 days and I realized like that was the cycle that I needed to break that, that anger. Yeah. And so that, I mean, that's the, gosh, I can't tell you how, I mean, I can, because I know you understand yeah. you wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's the anger. Like that anger is what it's being caused by. Is like that's the anger you felt as a kid when you were being abused. That's what my therapist reminds me of. That's the anger. And so instead of like you couldn't lash out then because as a survival mechanism, you kept it all in, you kept it all, right. all quiet. But now it comes out, you know, because and your kid especially is triggering because they're your little mini me's. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They are your mini me's. They yeah. are, you know. And I, and I, from my therapist, it, I, I was told that you'll probably be triggered at the age that you are triggered when your daughter reaches those, those milestones yeah. or that, that age. And I was like, oh gosh, I need to, I need to really, really be prepared <laughs> for this. Yeah. Uh, and it continues, right? So when I first started therapy, just so you know, when I, I was just like, okay, I'm going to have four sessions. I'm going to talk to this therapist. We're going to be good. We're going to have right. four We're sessions. That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's all I need, you know? Um, and of course, you know, I have an appointment with him later today, you know, it just, because each phase of your life brings something new up when you had an entire childhood, you know, of exactly. being abused. So exactly. It, it, uh, grow, I, it comes up. <laughs> yes. It's just the, the amount of time like that you've spent in this abuse, like it doesn't go away after like a week of therapy, you know, it's, you know, yeah, I went to, I went through 31 days of therapy and I'm just like of straight residential treatment, vigorous, you know, itinerary of treatment. (laughs) And I still am getting the help constantly. It's, it's really hard when you, that was your house. That was yeah. where, that was your environment that you that lived in. That was supposed in. to be the safe space. That was supposed to be where you were safe and exactly. protected, you know, and comforted. Like these were the people that were supposed to be building you up. Yeah. Oh. The opposite. So yeah, it's um, this idea, of, that's where I kind of think people need to change. You know, I know we want immediate satisfaction. I know we want everything to happen right away. I know we lack patience right now in, in today's world, but yeah, the work takes time and it is different for people and not, you know, it's not a one size fits all, you know, the therapy that's going to work for you might be different for me, but it's like, if people could just get started and know it's possible, that's the thing. It's like, you can be different. Like you can live differently. You can have the happiness and the experiences that you've been longing. They're all possible. 
They just require work, just like anything else takes work. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's not this overnight fix or it's not a magic pill. I wish it was, you know, I really do. I really do. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, but, but it's just going to require work, but I believe it's so worth it. You know, it's worth it for me and remembering like, why are you doing it? For me, my why was my husband and my daughter. And you then like, to me, you started chasing it. Like when you started experiencing feeling better and having better relationships, it's like, oh, okay, I want more of this, you know? And now it's for myself. Like I want to continuously be on this journey because I love, you know, this level of improvement. And it's not like every day, you know, um, you know, you have some like light bulb, but like those moments where it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I definitely am different and I feel better than I did, you know, last year or whatever it was. So Wow. Yes. It's, it's, it's very, it's gratifying. And, and, you know, this is why there's this podcast, right? It's because people can thrive after trauma. And, and I, and I, I can't stress that enough while it is hard work, just like you said, it's so worth it. And it's so worth not passing down that trauma. Yeah. Agreed. And that, and that's the thing, I think that belief and knowing that it is possible, right? It goes back to one of the consequences of abuse and trauma is you believe you're not worth it. You believe right. it's not possible for you. <laughs> and that's a consequence of it. And that's, it's like, but if you start doing the work, then you realize you are worth it and you can also have it. It's not that, you know, you're destined for a life of misery, you know? Right. It's, <laughs> um, it's yes, those are unfortunate consequences, but don't let it, you know, take every other part of your life. Exactly. Very well said. Um, and I know that y- your big thing is to not stay silent. Like you were saying, I think, I, I think it was, I mean, a light bulb went off in my head when you were talking about when your sister said something mm-hmm. and it was like that, that's so powerful. And I can't stress enough the importance of, you know, not staying silent um, with your abuse or your trauma, you know, for yourself and clearly for others, as your sister, you know, did for you. Um, so as a lawyer and as a person who is thriving after trauma, can you really talk about the importance of speaking out? Yeah. I mean, I like nothing's going to change if you don't speak out. I right. mean, that's kind of the reality of it. And so if you want something to change and you want something to be different, you have to say something. And again, I get how difficult it is. So I always say like, you can start with small steps, you know, if it means journaling, you know, you can journal it and at least just get it out from your, from your mind. You know, you can tell a friend, you know, you can find a therapist, you can find a lawyer. I mean, just getting it out doesn't mean like all of a sudden it's going to be public and everybody's going to know about it. It's just taking baby steps for you to confront and address the issue um, so you can start healing again yourself. And again, if it's happening to other people, you know, stopping it from happening it again, happening again. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would like to add? You know, I always say like, don't wait, you know, life is, is short and I think it's so precious and there's so many amazing experiences for you to have um, and enjoy. And I think once you can get on the path you know, you can have more of those. So I tell people, you know, don't wait. Um, And even starting, you know, taking one step, you know, is one step in the right direction. Wow. I completely agree. I know that a lot of my guests and, you know, it's never too late, but the sooner the better, right? You know, (laughs) I've had guests who have finally started their healing at age 50 and 60 and in they they realize that they can they wow i can live this life that i want to and you know i or, you know the sooner the better but sooner you know you, you you can always as you know when you're ready you're ready but i think correct definitely and it's not too late exactly it's, it's not, not like too late there's there's not an expiration date no. it's it's just there's no reason to to not start Right. There's so many good reasons to start. Yes. And even if it's to write it down, like you said, I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Alreen, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your oh, wisdom my pleasure. and definitely check out her book, Fired Up, Fueling Triumph from Trauma, her personal story. And I just 
learning how to channel it. I love that you're doing it. Just you're really, you are the epitome of a trauma survivor thriver. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me on and thank you for sharing um, your own story as well. Absolutely. That was Alreen Hagwist, lawyer and author of Fired Up, Fueling Triumph from Trauma. For more information on Alreen, check out the show notes. March's issue of Authentic Insider is out. Check out Authentic Insider at TraumaSurvivorThriver.com. That's TraumaSurvivorThriver.com, as well as the past episodes of a Trauma Survivor Thrivers podcast. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my email list to get Authentic Insider in your inbox monthly. We will be back next week when I speak with Jennifer Chesick, author of The Psilocybin Handbook for Women, when we discuss how psilocybin can benefit your mental, physical and spiritual health you've been listening to a trauma survivor thrivers podcast i'm Lori lee binstock thank you so much for being a part of the conversation take care